you can see a little bit of it cut across the bottom of the hill there. Yeah. It starts, as I said, outside the gate and then winds its way down to Altadena. Uh, it's locked now, but you can use it as a hiking path. So it's been wi widened now to be large enough to be a real road, but uh, was more of a trail for most of the history of the observatory. That little peak is called Mount Harvard. And uh, the story is that after this whole deal with Harvard fell apart, uh, the people in the city tried one more time, brought the president of Harvard out here, decided to name the peak after Harvard, thought maybe that would help convince them, but the deal never happened. They never built their observatory up here. So now that's just used for uh, radio transmitters. Hale was always interested in science as a kid. Uh, he built a little bedroom laboratory and had a microscope and a telescope and a lot of other little things along that line. Uh, all his life, the one theme that we can see that's consistent with Hale is he always wanted equipment that was bigger and better than what he had in terms of astronomy, and that he was really good at talking people with money into giving it to him in order to fund what he wanted to do. And that really started with his father. So uh, he went off to MIT for college, spent a lot of time at the Harvard Observatory, and actually invented a scientific instrument there that allowed you to photograph the sun in any colors of the spectrum. So you could take a picture of the sun in blue light or in red light or in green light, which really helped uh, begin this process of learning about the sun. Pasadena down there somewhere. Hotel Company basically owned the mountaintop. Hale signed a 100-year, 99-year, uh, I think, lease with them uh, in order to be able to put the observatory here uh, in 1904. He cleverly put in a renewal clause for a dollar for another 99 years. So in 2003, that lease was able to be renewed. Uh, it wasn't with the Mount Wilson Hotel Company anymore, but nonetheless, uh, so that's what we're working under right now. Uh, in the 1980s, the Carnegie Institution, which had funded everything here, remember I mentioned that, or maybe I didn't mention that, when Hale came out here, he had applied for a grant from the newly created Carnegie Institution, which is, was created by Andrew Carnegie to fund science of various types. He got some money, and that's what allowed him to get started out here, and over the years, they basically paid for everything that was done up here. Their offices were down in Pasadena, that's where the scientists lived, that's where their research labs were, and the astronomers would come up here for a few days at a time when they were actually using the telescopes for observations. But by the 1980s, there really wasn't a whole lot that could be done cost-effectively in terms of uh, scientific research up here for possible life. No, but we will see it when oh, we go okay. around. Okay. Is this the one that has the camera on the top or not? Yes, the webcam is on the top of this tower, right, right on top of the dome. Yeah, that program he wrote up and down. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, if you go to the Mount Wilson web... Yeah. So after the tour, you're free to wander around uh, to any of the places we've been and look a little more carefully. This is the 60-inch telescope. Uh, we're not going to go in there because it's a fairly small place for a big group to get in and out of. But for scale, you can see this guy sitting in a chair right here. Much more impressive uh, telescope. The volume of a telescope goes as like the third power of the mirror diameter. So I can give you an idea of how different they are from each other. Uh, so this telescope went into service in 1909. Uh, it became the world's largest telescope after the Yerkes 40-inch refractor was previously. So this was the second world's largest telescope that Hale gets credit for. In 1917, the 100-inch went into service. Uh, it then became the world's largest telescope until 1948 with the 200-inch at Palomar uh, opened. And Hale was responsible for that project, though we never lived to see it actually go into service. It's actually now called the Hale Telescope. Uh, and that remained the world's largest telescope until sometime in the 1970s. So Hale basically had the world's largest telescope or had credit for the world's largest telescope for on the order of 100 years. Uh, 
And then on top of that, that was the world's largest solar telescope for 50 years, so we're not even counting that. This is a picture of bringing part of the 100-inch telescope up the toll road, uh, the trail actually at that point. Uh, by the time they were building the 100-inch, they actually had some primitive trucks, but they couldn't make it up by themselves, so they would often have to pull them up with mules. Uh, when they were doing the 60-inch, everything came up just on mule-drawn carts Whoa. up that trail, and it was narrower than this at the time. If you look online, and actually I think there's a picture inside here, uh, you can find some photos of these sections of the telescope at about a 45 degree angle trying to fall off the road and being held up with cables. So they had a lot of near disasters in the process of doing that. This is a picture of Hale and Andrew Carnegie. He uh, came up here once in 1910 and he had paid for everything and it was cloudy that day. He never got to look through a telescope. But the other interesting thing about this picture, I talked about how good Hale was at getting money from rich people. Uh, what goes along with that is he had to be pretty tactful. Andrew Carnegie was very short. And you can see he posed here, Hale posed downhill from Carnegie, so it wasn't so obvious in the picture. And the big debate in astronomy was, are these actual galaxies? Some astronomers thought they were. The majority opinion was that they were balls of gas and stars that were within our galaxy. And that issue wasn't actually settled until Edwin Hubble uh, settled it with the 100 inch telescope in the early 1920s. So, uh, very big difference between the way we look at these things now after Hubble's work and the way they looked at them then. One other thing about the pictures I want to tell you these were taken probably with 100 inch telescopes, and they were exposures for many hours, sometimes maybe even two or three nights, they would put the same glass plate back in the telescope and expose it for more and more time. So that picture right there that you're standing in front of is the Whirlpool Galaxy, M51. And if you turn around behind you, there's a picture of the same galaxy right here, M51. The difference is instead of a 100 inch telescope, I was taking the 12 inch telescope. And instead of 10 hours of exposure, that's a one hour exposure. So anyone guess at what the difference is? Since the other one pivots to track the motion of the sun across the sky. And then the light goes through a lens here. It's reflected down into the room we're about to go to where the astronomers would be. And at that point, they get a 17-inch diameter image of the sun. But if they don't want to photograph it, but they want to do spectroscopy, they can move a slit onto any part of that image so that only that light continues on into this 80-foot pit underground hits this diffraction grating, which I mentioned breaks light up into its component colors. If you ever looked at the back of a CD and you hold it in a bright light, you see all sorts of rainbow patterns. That's because the pits on the CD, their spacing is on the order of the size of wavelength of light. This has a lot of very finely ruled parallel lines to accomplish the same thing. And what it does is it would break the spectrum of the sun up into a spectrum that would be huge if you could see the whole thing, you know, many, many feet across. And then they tilt the optics so that the particular color, here they're showing yellow, that they want to look at, comes back up into the room here and then they can measure it. And by doing that, they can make measurements of any color in the spectrum. And here's a picture of a solar spectrum. So the rainbow pattern's familiar, but there's a difference here. You see that there are black, thin black lines and there are some also thinner, brighter lines. The dark lines are called absorption lines and the bright lines are emission lines. We have our solar image here, and plus we've got a few clouds going by. So, at least you can get to see a few sunspots. The sun is not that active as far as sunspot numbers uh, compared to uh, about a month ago. A little over a month ago was peppered with far more spots. But <clears throat> there are a number so we see these, these two spots, and there's a spot here. There are a couple of really small ones that I don't see anymore. Now, the way we work with our solar image is that uh, each morning, one of the observations that we do is a sunspot drawing. And actually, these drawings go all the way back to 1917 when they were first begun. Uh, you might think, well, this is kind of a simple observation. Uh, uh, 
Um, but in fact, there's a lot of useful information that we record on these, these drawings. We, uh, first of all, draw the spots. And you can see if I lay this sheet out here, you'll see that those spots are indeed the same ones that you see at the moment. Uh, in fact, there's a new spot uh, that's just come into view this morning that wasn't there yesterday. It, it's kind of hard to see, but there is some very large spots may last more than, than one rotation. It takes about uh, 27 days for a full solar rotation. So if you have a really large sunspot or a sunspot group, it may come around for a second time. Uh, and we see that uh, periodically when there's a real active sunspot group. All the um, solar data from other observatories, from satellites, uh, from the SDO. So they, they, they use our drawings along with all the other stuff that they're getting. So that kind of makes us feel good with these. We get you to stay steady there. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> and then the clouds are going by too. <laughs> so there, you see that that sunspot is, looks like it's larger than the earth there. Then. One large spot there. Now, uh, I have a photograph of the very largest sunspot group that we've ever seen here. The photograph matches our scale here, and the, the date of this photograph was from April the 6th, 1947. So that's the way that sunspot group appeared <laughs> uh, back in 47. And <clears throat> that larger group, of course, uh, as far as solar flares, it did produce some, but none that were caused problems for the Earth. And of course, in 1947, we really didn't have to worry as much as we would nowadays because in 1947, we didn't have satellites, GPS, uh, all the kinds of <clears throat> modern technology we have now that could be affected by uh, disruptions um, from solar flares. essentially what's important about this scope. The 100 inch is important for the discoveries that were made with it, uh, Hubble's being the most famous ones. Uh, this telescope went into service about 1909. Uh, as I said, it became the world's largest telescope at that point until the 100 inch went into service. Uh, there were important discoveries made on this telescope though. Harlow Shapley, who uh, went on to be the director of Harvard Observatory, worked here for a number of years and he did an interesting study of globular clusters. These are essentially uh, balls of very old stars that surround our galaxy in a halo. And uh, this was the first telescope that was really big enough to see the dimmer and the further away of those clusters. And Shapley was able to plot where they are in the sky. And from that, he could deduce that we weren't actually in the center of our galaxy. So now everyone accepts the fact that, oh, we're out in a spiral arm on the side of the galaxy. But back then, it was actually assumed that we were in the center of the galaxy. You can't see the center of the galaxy because of dust between us and the center. So they didn't know, you know how tightly compacted the stars are there, and there's a black hole, and all sorts of reasons we wouldn't want to be there. But that's what astronomers thought. So Shapley's paper uh, made quite a difference in our perception of at least where we fall. Thank you. 
see the difference in scale between the buildings? Which was in 1909. So this telescope didn't get completed until 1917, but the making of the mirror was really a rather large adventure. Uh, the mirror was made by the same company, Saint Cobain Glassworks in France, that built the 60 inch disc that his father gave him for a present, or poured, I should say. Uh, but they didn't have a ladle for the molten glass that was big enough for a 100 inch mirror. So they ended up pouring it in several pours. And the result of doing that is that it looks like a layer cake, and there are a lot of bubbles inside the glass. So when the first mirror blank got here, uh, Hale looked at it and said, no way, we're accepting this. You know, we're not going to spend two years polishing this thing just to find out that you know, a bubble made it up to the surface or that it bends in a funny way with temperature because it's not homogeneous through the glass. When you need to maintain the shape so precisely, you worry a lot about how it changes with temperature. So we had to make several more mirrors, and the results were worse in each one. They cracked. You have to cool this glass slowly over several months. Uh, or just the overall condition was worse. So finally, he essentially forced his optician, George Ritchie, to start polishing this mirror uh, to build the 100-inch telescope. And they were really uncertain about how it would perform. Uh, the first night, the first light on the telescope, as they call it, uh, the image was really awful. And they were worried that you know, they had done something terribly wrong. But it actually turned out that someone had just left the dome open during the day and the mirror was hot. So when they gave it a few more hours to cool off, uh, everything looked fine. That's essentially a tank with mercury in it and a large float, and that's to make for low friction bearings so that it can move easily. The other pivot point is right here, and the telescope moves this way and that way to point at whatever it wants to see in the sky. So uh, the dome opens with these two doors here that slide sideways, and then of course the dome is rotated around so the opening is wherever your telescope happens to be pointing. So the light comes in at the top of the telescope. It comes down to the 100-inch uh, mirror at the bottom here, and it's then reflected back up to what's called prime focus, a spot right up near the top. So in theory, you could put a camera up there or put an eyepiece there, but a person would block too much light. And they Telemar one, that was one of those waffles. Yeah, it was done, it wasn't a solid disc. And that was also, by then they had Pyrex, which was a more advanced type of glass. This is just green wine bottle glass. Since the light doesn't have to go through it, 